Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Author in Residence series on Zero to IPO, a fireside chat with Frederick Crest. My name is Colin Mahan, and I'm the Director of Programs at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit that's building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. As you may have just seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Center launched a free mentor matching platform for entrepreneurs called Mentor Makers. You can create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with in the moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So find or become a mentor today by using that link in the chat. Speaking of the chat, we're gonna open up for a live Q&A near the end of the event. So please submit your questions for us in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen throughout the presentation. We hope to get to them all. Now, none of what we do here at the center could be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, and HubSpot. We're grateful and humbled by their contributions. Now, during these still, in so many ways, unique times, we're curious on how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs that we work with. So before we jump into our chat today, I'm gonna to launch a few polls. First one, how are you feeling about your business right now? Are you optimistic, in survival mode, feeling a little anxiety or fear? Let us know, we measure this to help improve the wellness programs that we provide for entrepreneurs worldwide. So appreciate you letting us know how you're doing. Alrighty, I'm gonna end this poll because I don't wanna waste too much time before we jump into the great content today. Looks like optimism is in the lead, but understand there's a little bit of survival mode and anxiety and a tiny bit of fear out there. Hopefully our conversation today will help alleviate some of those anxieties. Last question helps inform the programs that we should be offering to you, the entrepreneurs that we serve in the next couple months. So what's keeping you up at night? Is it sales, finance, marketing, team, pivot? Let us know. We'll use this information to guide the next batch of programs that we end up booking. Alrighty, thank you all for voting. Looks like finance is the winner here, which is going to be, I'm sure, something we're gonna to cover today in our conversation. So with that said, thank you all for participating in that poll. Without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome in the chat to our special guest today. We've got Jack Castle, who's the moderator, and he's also the head of new listings at NASDAQ. Hi, Jack. And we've got Frederick Crest, who's the author of Zero to IPO, our topic for this evening, afternoon, and morning, and the executive vice chairman, CEO, and co-founder at Okta. Jack, Frederick, welcome. Thank you, Colin. Very Thanks, much. Colin. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. I'm very excited about today. Excited to learn more. Jack, over to you. Great. So much. Thanks so much. Excuse me. Um, so thanks to everyone tuning in uh, here in the audience. We're very lucky to have uh, this candid conversation, Frederick. We, we understand how busy you are. Uh, but and somewhere in how busy you are, you fit in the time to author this great book, Zero to IPO. So I appreciate you also taking the time to share with us uh, some of your journey and, and some of your insights. Um, throughout this process. And I think just to kind of level set, right, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, they'll, they'll start with an idea, kind of this vision, uh, but you did such a great job throughout the book articulating, executing to that vision, being nimble, having to pivot, having to continue to just kind of think on your feet, especially as you, you face incumbents, as you face kind of the natural markets, as you face kind of the employee and the talent piece. So you did such a great job encapsulating all of that in this book. So again, congratulations and uh, and looking forward to, to our chat today. Thanks, um, Jack, I appreciate it. Thanks for the kind words. Absolutely. So Fred, let's start with your entrepreneurial story, right? Everybody has that, that kind of starting point. So maybe you can share some of your personal background and what drew you to entrepreneurship initially. Yeah, um, you know, that's actually one of the reasons that I wrote the book is historically the entrepreneurship literature has really been these glory stories about an entrepreneur and how amazing they are without a lot of the tips and tricks and, and helpful insight into actually how you build the business. So um, I'm happy to start with a little bit of, of my background, uh, but I'm, I'm glad that we can we can talk more broadly. And I, hopefully people are going to put some questions in the Q&A, as I told Jack and Colin earlier. 
You can ask me anything you want, personal or professional. I might not answer, but I will not be offended. <laughs> so I think I've always been interested in in uh, in business. Uh, I was fortunate; my dad was was an entrepreneur, and so I kind of grew up in that household um, of seeing how that worked of of agency, of hard work, of of coming up with your own ideas and kind of pursuing them. Um, I have a a a, a, a great uh, history of starting failed businesses. Uh, as a as a younger kid, I started a. Uh, a can recycling business like Coca-Cola cans when I was seven or eight years old um, and then spent all that money at the arcade. I started a high school, I started a tennis racket restringing business in high school uh, that that went bankrupt and didn't go very well. Um, after graduating from college, I joined and helped build a system, a technology system integrator company in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico. It went pretty well until Argentina had a revolution, which made it a little more challenging to run a business. So um, certainly, I had I had plenty of uh, of uh, near successes, which we can also call failures, uh, early on in my career. Um, I spent some time at, at Salesforce.com when it was a small company. I saw it grow, and then obviously we started Okta uh, 13 years ago, and, and here we are today. So, love it. So you all you've always had that entrepreneurial spirit, and and that's. Uh, I think one of the attributes, right, is continuing to to kind of learn from those near near successes or failures yeah. as you continue to build uh, kind of towards that mission. So maybe then let's go to to Okta. 2009, yeah. uh, you were you know working with your friend Todd McKinnon, and um, what what problem did you see in the market that that you wanted to solve, or, or where was the market headed that you thought, hey, if we could do something here this could scale and, and there's a real business opportunity for us. Yeah, well, um, you know, Todd and I are enterprise software uh, people. We both got computer science degrees. I got one in the late 90s. Uh, I started working in, in industry uh, before the 2000 bubble. So we learned in the uh, client server and then the three-tier architecture world of software and enterprise software where you're really deploying it and installing it. And then we both started at Salesforce in the early days. I started there in 2002 when there was, you know, 100, 150 people. He started in 2003 and we were both there for a number of years working together. And we had a front row seat to, you know, arguably the biggest technology transformation in my, that we're going to see in my professional career, which is the transformation from on-premises software to software delivered as a service over the internet. And, you know, we sat there at Salesforce and drank a lot of Kool-Aid on the value of, you know, what we called software on demand first and software as a service and today enterprise cloud, um, you know, just in terms of the ROI, return on investment, the total cost of ownership, the time to value that companies were getting and using uh, Salesforce.com really led us to believe that this was going to be a big trend and that a lot of the critical infrastructure um, software, all the stuff that's context, not core software, not the core systems that NASDAQ runs to run the actual exchange, but all the uh, context systems, the collaboration suites and email and CRM and financials and HR. We took a bet that that was all going to move to the public cloud over 10, 20, 30 years. And that to do that intelligently, enterprise IT doesn't throw anything away. What they do is they buy new things and they glue them on the front. And so we said, well, there's going to have to be a bunch of new integration layers that are going to occur. Uh, and we took a bet that one of those was going to be identity, that identity was going to come out of all these platforms. There's always been identity. It was part of the Oracle suite or the IBM suite or the NetSuite or the, the Microsoft suite or, or whatever uh, you know, stack of software you were using. But we took a bet that there was going to be a proliferation of, of software vendors and that that identity was going to come out of those and become a primary cloud. And you know, lo and behold, we're a 13 year overnight success. <laughs> Love that. Um, well, and I, I think to that point, right, the 13 years and the, the grind that it is to, to get to that overnight success. Um, I love the line, but it is it is a grind to get there. And, I was a lot. The, I know it's hard to believe, Jack, but I was actually a lot taller and better looking when we started. <laughs> oh, I doubt it. I doubt it. It would have been too good looking. Uh, but so with that, maybe Frederick, then, you know, what but what was kind of that tipping point then as you started to develop it? You had this thesis, you're going to market, um, you're, you're starting to really develop this and, and likely get some momentum. 
But what was that tipping point when you said, okay, this is really worth now me leaving Salesforce or, or really investing the time, the energy, going out to fundraise, which I do want to touch upon as well. Yeah. But how did you kind of know that, hey, this is worth now committing to Okta and starting to really drive and scale this business? Yeah, actually, we had both left Salesforce before we started Okta. And you okay. know, I, I was fortunate I met uh, Mark Andreessen gave me this tip. I met him 15 years ago at a at a long, almost 20 years ago at a social event, and I started chatting with him. and uh, And he said, "Look, you know what I've seen is that people can only focus on building one, you know, putting all their effort and energy behind one initiative at a time." Now, granted, now we've got Elon Musk, and we could we could argue how well he's doing that. But in general. You can't be doing two things, you know, with all the focus and determination that you need to build a giant business. And so, um, you know, that kind of resonated with me. And I remembered that. And I left Salesforce in 2007. Company had gone from, you know, 150 to 3,000 employees. It had gone from 25 million to 750 million, almost a billion dollars. I mean, today it's 30, but almost a billion dollars. We'd gone public. So things had changed a lot. I went back to graduate school. Uh, at MIT, the MIT Sloan School of Management, I got an MBA in entrepreneurship and innovation, and I was investigating different businesses that I was planning to start. And my co-founder, Todd, who we had worked together at Salesforce and, and were kind of professional colleagues, he had left Salesforce in January of 2009. And we kind of started dating in the spring of 2009. I was still, um, I was still wrapping up my MBA, but we started Okta in May of 2009. Um, which was the month before I actually finished uh, at MIT. And, um, you know, we, we really, we, we took a bet and you got to take a bet on yourself as an entrepreneur. I mean, there is no sure thing, you know, if it's already being written about and wired, like it's already, it's already over. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to, you need to take a bet on a big industry where there's going to be a lot of disruption and where you have a significant competitive advantage. In our case, we had a lot of experience in, enterprise IT in general, but also specifically in building um, what was at the time and still today the number one enterprise cloud company in terms of the technology stack, which was which was pretty unique. Now, that being said, you know, we went through all the same trials and travails that everyone else goes through. You know, we almost died 10 times in, in 2011. It was certainly a very, very tough year. And, you know, here we are, you know, a decade later, um, and it's, you know, a $1.5 billion revenue company growing 40% year over year with 5,000 employees. So from the outside, you know, it looks like it's a fantastic up and to the right story. We are destined for greatness, but nothing can be further from the truth. We, like almost every other, you know, successful company out there almost died uh, a number mm -hmm. of times. And that was actually one of the reasons I wrote the book was kind of to peel the onion back. And for all the entrepreneurs out there, you know, who think that Amazon or Meta or, you know, Netflix were destined for greatness, nothing can be further from the truth. And it's just a lot of hard work every day. And, um, you know, kind of demystifying some of the some of the process behind entrepreneurship was was really something that, um, you know, that I thought was important to do. And, and which is why I invested some time to write the book. Wow, you, well, you nailed it. And, uh, and so we're kind of just grabbing that conversation with Mark Andreessen. I yep. mean, Okta, early on, you had garnered the interest of, of some of the best VCs in the Valley here. And, and also that kind of collective uh, brain power. Yep. Um, but then you also shared, even with that, you almost died 10 yep. plus times, right? So maybe walk well, us why through- Why do you have to be like that, Jack? I said 10, I didn't say 10 plus. I mean, come on now. <laughs> I'm uh yeah, glass, I'm glass half full. So yeah, I love it. I love it. I got my tilde 10 there. I love it. Uh so but so with that, maybe walk us through for the entrepreneurs um in audience and, and tune it in, yeah. just kind of that fundraising mindset. And obviously you had to have some difficult conversations or you really had to make certain decisions yeah. that was best for the company and likely in council with those board members of VC. So maybe give us a, a bit of perspective on, on your approach there. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, taking a step back, uh, I've had a fair amount of fundraising experience over the last 13 years. As a private company, we raised just under $230 million across seven rounds of venture capital financing. Uh, we raised $170 million in an IPO, obviously on NASDAQ. There's no other platform that makes sense. Uh, on April 7th, uh, 2017. And then since then, in the last five years, um, we've done $2.3 billion of convertible debt issuance as well. So 
um, you know, the, the, and in addition to that, I'm a, I'm a fairly active uh, angel investor in enterprise software and infrastructure where I think I can really help entrepreneurs. And so I see a lot of what they go through today. Um, you know, our, the, the, what's funny is that, you know, our seed round was a million dollars and our series A was 10. And I think today, $10 million is like a pre-seed or something that I don't even know what that means. So you, you got to rewind the clock significantly, but um, you know the overall the and we were very fortunate, as you said. The biggest investors uh, when we went public in the company were Sequoia Capital, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Greylock, and Kosla, and certainly those were uh, phenomenal uh, partners for us. Not just capital partners, but business building partners, and not just partners in terms of the people involved, but just the firms overall and the support they gave us. Um, so without a doubt, uh, we would not be where we are today without a lot of help. You know, it takes a village. It truly does. Um, but the biggest thing when I talk to entrepreneurs today, and I even talked to one already earlier this morning who, who's working on finalizing his Series B, is you have to make sure that you're painting a vision. I mean, investors are looking for opportunities to follow amazing entrepreneurs on a journey, and they want to be brought on that path to the future. So your job as an entrepreneur is to explain how you're going to get there. Now, arguably, you know, raising private capital and public capital are different. You could argue that uh, raising private capital is easier or harder. It's harder because you have to go up and down and, and you have to do these rounds and over and over. When you're a public company, you can raise a billion dollars of debt in a day. On the other hand, when you're a private company, you just have to convince one person of your vision. Whereas when you're a public company, you know, we just had our 21st earnings call. Not that I'm counting, but if I were, it would be 21. And you have to talk to this entire investor base that ranges from retail investors all the way to, you know, the biggest mutual fund uh, holders and, and hedge funds around the world. And, and, and so the, the messaging is different. When you do find that, that right person, though, who believes in where you're going and what you're doing, you just have to explain to them what the future is going to look like, why you are the right one to bring them into that future, and what the potential is down the road. Um, you know, people are always, uh, professional investors are, are looking for the venture capital business is a home run business. They're looking for home runs. Um, you know, that by their own measure, they say if they invest in 10 companies, they fully expect seven to go bankrupt, two to return capital. And if one is a home run, that's a top tier venture capital fund. Yeah. And so you really have to paint the vision on how you're going to be that home run and, and how it's going to work and why you're the right person with their partnership. And, um, and if you can paint, do a good job of painting a vision uh, and a mission, uh, you know, I, I think that's a that's always a very good place to start. Uh, that's that's very well said. And, and I want to kind of take that same approach and now bring that over to building the team mm -hmm. and really kind of building out that culture, which you have done an incredible job at Okta as well. Um, what selling that dream, that's that's one element, right? Because you're also you need to be real in the sense that you want to attract the right talent. Yep. Right? You don't want somebody that's just signing up because they they're thinking IPO 10 years down. You want somebody that's going to again, put on the chin strap and, and kind of get in there with you. So maybe share a bit around your approach to kind of team building, identifying some of that talent and, and how you kind of your broader perspective again on creating that initial culture. Um, absolutely. I think, you know, founders have to start thinking about workplace culture from the very beginning. And I'll be honest, I, I did not, I, I was not a and a, uh, a student of that lesson. And I give a lot of credit to Todd for that. And, um, you know, I was like, look, uh, let's just get uh, a keg and have, you know, bring your bring your dog to work day and, and make it a great environment and people are going to do well. Turns out you actually need to do a little more than that. And so uh, Todd was very good about that. You need to think about from early on, you know, what values to promote and practice in your organization. Um, you need to write them down and you need to espouse those values. You need to behave in the right way. Um, and then, you know, it's hard to interview for culture, but you still need to find ways to, to identify the attributes in people you want to join your company that map to how you want your company to behave. And, you know, at this point in, in, our, in our company, you know, we, we had hundreds of employees every quarter and um, you know, I used to be the only salesperson and certainly the first 10 or 20 customers, I, I closed them all myself. You know, I think last quarter we added eight or 900 customers. Well, you know, I talked to a few of them, but certainly not most of them. And so 
at this point, culture becomes, um, you know, what, how people are behaving when no one else is looking. And so you have to really think about that early on. And, and like you said, that first set of employees is going to do a lot of the culture driving because, you know, the next set joins and there's a manager and it's like, how does my manager behave and how does the other people on my team behave? And, oh, that's how we behave at this company. So that's how I'm going to behave. And, you know, you should, you should think carefully about what those culture, uh, cultural or core values are. You should write them down. Uh, we started with seven. People told me they couldn't remember seven things, which I thought was shocking, but that's fine. So we made it three and then four. And today we are at, we're at five. And it's been the same stable five for the last three or five years. Um, and they're ones that we have to repeat constantly because every 90 days there's hundreds of new employees. And so you have mm -hmm. to tell them over and over you know, what they are. You have to write them down. You have to talk about them. But you also have to emphasize uh, actions that you have seen employees take where they have really espoused the cultural values that you want your company to embody. Um, and there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Um, you know, one of them is we have uh, our uh, co company-wide all hands. Most Thursdays, we, we just moved it from Fridays to Thursdays, actually, because now we have so many folks internationally that the Australians were like, I'm not watching it. It's two o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning on Saturday. So now they have no excuse because it's two o'clock in the morning on Friday, but it's recorded so they can watch it on Friday morning anyway. So we still do 40 of those a year. You know, we take off for Thanksgiving and the holidays and, and whatever else. Um, but at those, we talk a lot about our corporate values. We talk about behavior that we've seen that, that we want to espouse. And then, you know, we, you also got to find ways to talk about uh, behavior you've seen that you don't like. And you don't want to single people out for, for bad behavior. Typically, what I'll do is I'll tell a story about how I did something that I shouldn't have done that uh, that is representative of what I saw that I didn't like. That person's going to know that you're talking about them, but but it means a lot to the rest of the of the team and the company because they see, oh, the founders talking about this. This must be important. So, and you have to live and model those values every single day, which is challenging. I mean, at this point, as a Section 16 officer of a public company, I basically have a megaphone strapped to my mouth at all times, and so you got to think a lot about what you're saying and what you're doing and how you're doing it, and um, you know, be be conscious and aware of that so that, again, you can create that culture. You want your employees to behave the right way when no one else is looking. And if you can really get that and get that right, I think, you know, that that will drive a, a lot of value, you know, for you and, and ultimately for all stakeholders. Right. The, the entire environment around your company. Finally, the last thing I would say is that's really a culture is really something that folks should work on in easy times and it will pay off in hard times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it seems counterintuitive. You're like, oh, things are going well. Why would I put in this extra work? You put in the extra work because the culture will really come to bear when you hit a hard time, either macro, uh, which, you know, we've got plenty of examples of right now, whether you've got challenges inside your own company for whatever reason, um, that's when you'll really see how the team gels, how they come together. Um, and so you should really spend the time, the effort, the energy put in the extra work uh, when you don't need to, and it'll really come back and pay dividends when you need it. No, that's a great point. And, uh, and exactly that, just the ROI on the time that you have um, for, because when, when bullets are flying, it's tough to start slowing yourself down to concentrate on other things. So that's yep. a very good point on timing. You know, not to not to jump ahead to present day with some sure. of this, because I do like following the order. Um, but, you know, right now, sticking with team and culture, we're seeing such a evolution, if you will, from flex to hybrid to work from home. Also for Okta, you're at such a global scale where you have offices around the world. I guess what, what's been kind of a few things that have worked well for you or, or in your approach to continue to maintain that culture, though we're not um, you know, in the office like we were 18 months ago on a regular and consistent basis? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, the underlying, the underlying piece there is, is the global pandemic that we've gone through. My wife keeps reminding me that global and pandemic are actually synonymous. There is no such thing as a local pandemic. So I apologize. The pandemic that we've gone through, she's a doctor, so she'll be exact. The pandemic that we've gone through over the last two and a half years has certainly, you know, exacerbated some of those challenges that you just mentioned. Um, you know, I think communication is more important than ever, right? Uh, especially in this, you know, remote world where it's kind of like Hollywood squares, 
it's it's easy to you know to hate people or to get angry at people or to be upset at people when they're little squares on a picture. Um, mm -hmm. And it's much harder to do that in person. So even in all these remote work environments, um, some of which have been basically mandated by the, uh, you know, by the, the environments in which we find ourselves from COVID-19, but also now we also have a much more distributed uh, workforces for many um, white collar environments because, you know, the internet works. So you can do your job from anywhere. There's still a lot of value in getting people back uh, together, even if you just do that from time to time. And so I really want to encourage entrepreneurs to think about that because ultimately humans are, are social creatures. And so you can live in these remote environments, but you have to make sure you've got those in-person touch points, uh, regardless of, of whether you're in-person or, or dynamically remote, which I can talk a little bit about what we do at Okta, being as present as possible, checking in with people. I actually have a noon to one blocked off most days on my calendar as uh, eat lunch and call people, just calling people over the phone, checking in on them, uh, emailing them at random times to see how they're doing. You know, I know that the, you know, I'm kind of old, so I like the phone and email. I know people use Slack and a lot of these modern technologies. Don't worry, I have Slack up too. So I can use Slack. I just, it's just so much um, that, uh, you know, just, just checking in and seeing how people are doing, I think is really important. At Okta, what we've done is we've really focused on uh, dynamic work. And what that means for us is, is two things. We were fortunate, actually, we started piloting dynamic work. Um, we started piloting dynamic work in 2019. So before the pandemic hit, because we found that the flexibility increased um, empowerment, uh, satisfaction, productivity. And so for us, dynamic work is two things. It's dynamic workforce, meaning that you know people, the best people in the world are all over the place. We were very fortunate uh, that we were able to combine forces with a great company called Auth0 um, mm -hmm. just about 15 months ago. 800 people mm -hmm. came into our company and they were remote uh, from the beginning. So they had this amazing culture of everyone was everywhere. They'd get back together at these key moments, but they knew how to work. And we'd been working on developing that muscle, but they'd been doing it since the very beginning. And so that, that was uh, very important. So dynamic work is dynamic workforce, right? Getting the best people wherever they are, but it's also dynamic workplace. And so what we found was that if you just looked in, the, in our offices, a lot of times you had a bank of you know 10 desks. Well, they'd only be half full because salespeople are out on the road or sales engineering or somewhere else or customer support is working from home that day. And so actually there was ways that we could optimize uh, our office space, which as you said, is, is in all the major, you know, metropolitan centers around the world at this point. So, you know, the, the pandemic certainly accelerated our move to dynamic work. Uh, I think the, the experience and the vision uh, that we had is widely applicable to every company thinking about how they're going to reinvent their work environments, um, you know, making work just more, more livable and more sustainable. I understand um, I, I'm a senior advisor to um, to Blackstone, and I know they spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, they're the biggest real estate provider and owner in the world. And so for them, actually having people in the office is important as part of the business. I totally understand and value that. I've heard the same from a number of the large banks and, and what uh, Jay, mm -hmm. Jamie Dimon and everyone else has said. So it's going to vary by industry. But certainly, I think for a lot of the folks in this audience, entrepreneurial technologists, you just need to find the right balance and you are going to find amazing people. They're not always going to be in the metropolitan place where you are. You can build great companies today from anywhere. That's one of the things I talk about in the book. I talked to, with a number of entrepreneurs who built um, great companies, not only throughout the United States, but throughout the world. Right. And so you, yeah. you really, there's a, there's a lot of opportunity out there. You just have to think again, back to your previous question about culture and team, about how you want to build that and what that looks like. And just, you know, be thoughtful and be proactive about, you know, make sure that culture isn't something that happens to you. Make sure dynamic work or how you deal with remote isn't something that happens to you, but that it's something that you have happened. And if you do that and you're really thoughtful about that, I think the, the outcome can be very good. Yeah, well said. Well, you're obviously executing that at, at a very high level. And so far, so think, good. Knock on yeah, wood. Yeah, uh, again, knocking on wood. <laughs> Uh, no, well said. Um, and, and I think, again, that's a, just a, a testament to your leadership as well, which I, I know continues to evolve too, right? As you face yeah. these different trials, you continue to learn, you continue to take that feedback and maybe yeah. it's a broader feedback loop on what's working or not. And then you start to continue to just 
build and execute that yep. leadership strategy going forward. So now I, I do want to take us back uh, to maybe probably 2016 at some point with, with you and Todd and the broader executive team and, and likely your board saying, hey, you know what, the next step for us, whether it was a fundraise or, or kind of liquidity or whatever that impetus is or was, but is to go public and to, uh -huh. to do an IPO. Yep. So maybe walk us through that those later discussions and, and also when you knew you were at scale and it was the I right still, time. I still have my opening there it is. Uh, nice. board right here. If you can see it, I don't know what the glass, yes. but it says oh, Box got it. Opening bell. listed opening bell, April 7, 2017. So yeah. Oh, that was a good day. Yeah. So so maybe with that, when when did you feel or, or get a sense that okay, at, we're at scale, we can you know sustain you know what we want to do, achieve our goals as a public company now, yeah. and and maybe just kind of walk us through the process of not only when you knew, but kind of what led up, and then maybe occurred leading up to the IPO following that. Yeah, well, I mean, our plan was always to go public. You know, uh, I, I tell entrepreneurs, you know, a, a part of being an entrepreneur is you get to choose and decide how you want to build companies and there's no right or wrong answer you know people say oh should i do this should i do that? i don't know do you want to do that right okay. so um uh, if you think about you know your, your local bodega where you might go later today to get a sandwich or something that's an entrepreneurial environment now it might just be a cash flow business but that's fine i know plenty of very successful entrepreneurs who are in the business of building technology companies for a few years and selling them to a big company going through their earnout and kind of doing it again with the same team. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, we, we decided early on that we were going to build a large independent public technology company. So the piece of public was always there for us. And it wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when. Now, obviously, you need to make sure that there are IPO windows are open and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, we, we always thought about, you know, when we were going to get there, what made sense. Obviously, you know, when companies like Microsoft went public 30 plus years ago, you could go public with 20, 40 million dollars in revenue. Today, it's got to be north of 100, 150, 200, growing nicely with a, a durable business and a big market. And so, you know, and that, that's obviously there, there are very well laid out guidelines that, that you can talk to, you know, intelligent folks like yourself, Jack, just to hear a little more about and understand what, what that looks like. So for us, it was never a question of uh, if, it was a question of when. In fact, you know, as we started seeing the IPO coming, we started shifting the goalposts for the company to even stop talking about the IPO because mm. we didn't want everyone to come to this climax at the IPO and then show up at work the next day and be like, now what? So we talked about for us, the process of going public was about high school graduation. It's something that, you know, everyone goes through, but, and you probably know a person or two who peaked at high school graduation, but you don't want to be that person. And so it's a normal part of the process. And then you become a young adult, right? And you, you join the workforce and, and you kind of go on from there. And uh, so we started talking about that late 15, early 16, about, look, we're, we told the company, we said, we're going to go public. I don't know if it's this month, next month, next quarter. I kind of knew because I was running the S1 registration document that it wasn't going to be next month. But yeah. I don't know if it's, you know, what exact quarter it is or what exact date it is, but don't worry, it's going to happen. But let's think about what happens after that. Let's think about how we build an iconic technology company. And at that point, we said, look, getting to a billion dollars would be great. Look, now we're we're forecasting 1.8 this year, and we have a $4 billion target for FY26, which is just three years from now that we've laid out in our long range plan to the street. So, you know, clearly we're, you, you have to keep moving and, and keep growing and keep changing and reinventing yourself as a company and as a leader. But we knew that that was going to come. Um, you know, I, I think the, the IPO process, and, and I talk a little bit about in, in the book, I mean, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. Obviously there's a, a SPAC program, which a lot of people are going through now, the special purpose acquisition companies, um, there are, you know, which was kind of a four letter word, then it kind of came back, it might be four letter word again, but it looks like some people are using it again. So I'm not sure it's somewhere in the middle. I'm sure there's SPAC experts on the call. I am not one of them. There are direct listings, where basically you just want to be out on the public markets, but you don't want to sell any stock. Um, I think Slack did that, if I'm not mistaken, um, yeah. and some others as well. Point um, and then there's a traditional IPO. And, you know, people say, well, in the IPO, you know, the banks are going to make a bunch of money and they're going to flip a bunch of stock to their friends and all these other kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, some of that's true, but I mean, that's part of the process. You know, you, they got to people get paid for the, the work that they do. 
I think there's a lot of value in going public by a traditional IPO. I think not only raising the capital, but also starting to build relationships with a brand new customer base, which are public market shareholders. And, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays, these public market shareholders, a lot of times will drift into the later stage private company rounds so that they can get to know the entrepreneur so that they can maybe get some shares ahead of time before they become public, which is fine. Um, you know, the experience that I've had over the last five years of, of uh, running a public company, doing earnings, working with both the buy side and the sell side has been phenomenal. I've met some very, very smart people. Um, they've given me good advice and feedback and input on the business. And it's just another customer base that, I, that I've been fortunate to build relationships with. So from my perspective, that's gone very well. There's also a whole bunch of other attributes, just to be very clear, that I think public being public uh, will significantly drive value for, for your company. First of all, it's just exposure. It's just the name, the brand name. No one knows. No one, I mean, still you could argue today, who knows who Okta is? Many people don't, but a lot less people did before we went public, in particular internationally, right? All of a sudden you're, you're public and then international uh, companies will say, oh, who is this? You know, now I can look at them a little bit more. You know, their, their uh, financials are audited by, by, you know, some big four firm. And uh, same is true, by the way, into selling to large enterprise. Large enterprise doesn't like to buy. We're an enterprise company. We sell to businesses in the government. Um, you know, I know it's a little bit different for consumer businesses, but in, at least in enterprise businesses, Large companies, you know, they're a little bit hesitant to buy from private companies because when you when you're a private company, you don't really you don't have I mean, you have audited financials, but, you know, early on, you don't really. And whoever is buying is kind of taking a bet on you. And if it backfires, that could be a you know career limiting move. So once you're public, large companies feel a lot more comfortable partnering with you. And then finally, from an employee perspective, a lot of employees want a stability of a large public company. Of course, there are employees who want to go to earlier stage and want the upside. But there's a lot of employees who say, look, I've got a mortgage. I've got kids I got to put through college. I've got, you know, maybe uh, parents I have to take care of. And I need some stability, not only just in terms of the company I'm going to, uh, but also, you know, cash uh, compensation and other things, you know, benefits, I mean, all the rest of it. So, it's really been a big driver for us in, in hiring, attracting, developing, retaining, growing the next generation of leaders at Okta who want to join a public company. Um, you know, now we're five years in, people have gotten a pretty good taste and we're, we're, st we're still today. I mean, we have amazing folks that have been with us a long time, but today we're still attracting some of the best and the brightest folks out there who are saying, wow, this is where I, you know, Okta is now becoming a destination company. And people are saying, that's where I want to go build my career for the next five, 10, 15 years. And that wouldn't happen if we if we were a private company. So, you know, there's there's a I know that there's a you know, there's a lot of talk about the value staying private longer. Frankly, I think that the sooner you can get public where it makes sense, if it makes sense for right. your business, the better off you're going to be. It's going to force you to really drive operation and process and systems in an efficient way. Whereas when you're a private company, you can kind of throw money and bodies at, at problems that probably aren't the right way to do things. So. Uh, for us, it was a great experience. It has been a great experience. Uh, it's something I'm very happy that we did. Um, you know, we could talk about the roadshow and kind of that process, which, you know, was a good one, but probably not as good as being public for five years. Uh, but yeah, overall, I'm, I uh, I think it's been a really good thing for for us and, and, and all stakeholders, frankly, at Okta. Yeah, well, very well said. I mean, it's been so incredible to watch that evolution on the public side, obviously track it in the relationships on the private side. But once you got to that pinnacle point, and again, I, I love that you, the high school grad analogy or, you know, just that milestone, right? Many, yep. many more to come. Don't take our foot off the pedal and we continue yep. to accelerate. Um, but really, uh, again, just kind of the the attributes and, and the positive elements of being a public company, because there's a lot of scrutiny, there's a lot of disclosure, there's a lot going on in, in how quickly the markets move today, especially, again, this kind of gets magnified through uh, the volatility we've recently seen. But I think as you've experienced year over year, quality, one, rises to the top and quality deals get done and quality is always going to outshine a lot of the noise. Yep. So it's been, it's been very fun to be on that public journey with you and, and watching closely. Um, I, I do want to hit one thing just for the audience and the entrepreneurs here. You, um, being a leader yourself, generating the next group of leaders, we've seen a lot over the, over the last uh, you know, few months through the pandemic, but also the market volatility, kind of a lot of the noise as I mentioned in the market, 
What are some of the things that leaders can and should be doing to really just keep a balance of their kind of emotional and, and their own self health? And how do you kind of continue to fuel that part of, of being a leader? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, you know, taking care of your mental, emotional health is just as important as everything else. Um, I mean, I, I have uh, folks who help me with all those things, physical, mental, emotional, uh, to make sure that I'm explicitly carving out time for myself and all the things that are you know, most important for me. You know, it's kind of the um, I, I recently took a took a flight again, which is exciting to do uh, with my kids and, and took them to Disneyland. And actually, the, the stewardess reminded me, you know, when you're flying with little kids, they say, hey, make sure you put your oxygen mask on before you take care of putting the mask on the little kids. And the reason being, of course, if you're focused on the little kids and getting theirs on, like you won't get it on yourself and, and like they can't do it by themselves anyway. And the same is true in building a business. Um, if you're not taking care of yourself as a leader, everyone else who's reliant on you, not only personally, but professionally, maybe in your family, that you're not going to be operating at your best self to help all of them out. And so ultimately, the whole system is going to uh, degrade as a result. So taking time out to make sure you're focused on whatever is important to you and, and other things. Look, work is always going to be there and there's always endless amounts of work. I mean, if I if I wanted to, I could work 24 hours a day and I wouldn't get everything done. And so, you know, it becomes a prioritization story. Um, in the book, I talk about the Eisenhower decision matrix. Uh, it was named after obviously Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was a, a famous general in World War II and then became a two-time president of the United States. Um, and he came up with a really simple two by two. Of course, all the McKinsey experts will love that. Um, matrix about priority prioritization decision making. Um, and, and I use it and I use it all day long. I mean, I, I update probably my priorities five times a day. I already have twice this morning. And so I've got the same system on all my devices. Uh, I, I'll do it on paper in the middle of the night so I don't pull out an electronic device and then I'll move it over to, to electronic in the morning so that it's all centralized and I can see it. But basically the, the, you know, the short version of the matrix is you should focus on the things that are urgent and important. The things that are urgent but not important, you should delegate. The things that are important but not urgent, you should schedule. And if they're not urgent and not important, just delete them. And you really have to get in the process of understanding that what you do, time is your most precious asset. Uh, there's, there, there are three takeaways that I put in the first couple pages of the book so that if people really can't deal with what I have to say, that's fine. But if they walk away with those three things, that'll be great. First one is time is your most precious asset. It's your most valuable asset. I mean, it's not coming back. And especially if you raise, if you're fortunate to raise an institutional venture capital, there's basically a fuse on that money. I mean, they're not in the business of investing in you to build a business over 20 years and then have some return. Like they, their funds are limited. Their LPs are uh, large fund managers or, or institutions. And so, you know, you, you got to get going and you got to make sure you're focusing on the most important things. And when you're building a company, there's a lot coming at you. And so making sure that you're focusing on the things that you need to focus on is key. But you also need to take time out and realize that, you know, you, you need to take a night off. You need to decompress. If you play sports, you should make sure you're on a team and make those practices. If you, you know, play music, you should find time to play with your bandmates. Uh, in my case, I also read a lot. So I make sure that I read a lot of books, especially at night before I go to bed. It, it allows me to like clear my mind and actually go to sleep without thinking about the 25 things I was doing right before I did. Uh, right before I got in bed. And that, by the way, I'm going to be thinking about it as soon as I get up in the morning. So, um, you know, whatever, whatever is important, you know, yoga, I mean, there's all meditation is out there is, is, a, has, has certainly grown in, um, in prevalence. I think among founders that I talk to, there's all sorts of applications now that make it very easy to do that. Um, and so, you know, just making sure you're taking care of yourself. I mean, remember it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Now you, you have to run seven minute miles. So it's fast <laughs> marathon. But, you know, there's there's a long way to go. I mean, we're 13 and a half years in. You know, I got up at 6 a.m. this morning to come to work. So, um, you know, the it, it never it never stops. You just need to find the right balance so that you can play that long game as at the at the top level that you can. Absolutely. Well, uh, again, all very well said. I, I do want to say we've got some time here for Q&A and appreciate uh, for the audience members that have submitted a few questions. So I'm just gonna kind of read through a few of these and Frederick will uh, we'll see whatever you're uh, comfortable answering. Sounds great. Um, so first one here uh, is just 
sharing a little bit around how you actually acquired your first customer or customers. And, and did you did you start with marketing? Was it kind of a network of facts? Maybe walk through that that first one or first few logos that you landed. Yeah, well, um, in general, again, I'm, I'm kind of an I'm I'm uh, I'm much more well versed on enterprise software, so it's a little bit different for consumer software or or other kinds of technologies in general, hardware or what have you. Um, in in enterprise, there's a, a good book I recommend called "The Four Steps to the Epiphany," written by a gentleman named Steve Blank, that really um, emphasized, you know, you gotta as a this, the, the CEO of yesteryear was a salesperson. The CEO of today and tech, tomorrow is a technologist. Technologists know a lot about technology, but they don't know that much about go-to-market and GNA. And, and so sitting in your ivory tower and building what you think is the future without having the rubber meet the road and running it in front of uh, potential customers is a mistake. You should be talking about your idea and showing your idea to as many people as often as possible. In the first months, uh, we had... By month, I had targets of talking to between 15 and 18 net new uh, folks in IT. A lot of times it was managers or directors. Sometimes I got to a VP. Uh, a lot of times it was small businesses because, you know, the CIO at Nike is not going to talk to you when you're a brand new company. Um, and just, you know, running your plan by them and showing them at first it was wireframes and then it was a little bit of code and then it was a little more code and then it was an application and then you know, we finally, the first order form we got was in December of 20, of 2009, and it was for $400. Uh, you couldn't even deploy the software, but, you know, it, we got we got the order and I made them pay. And so, um, you know, another big piece of that is, you know, I don't like the story of uh, free trials. People are always saying, oh, or not, sorry, not free trial. Free trials is, is one of the approaches, as long as you limit that, whether it's mm -hmm. by functionality or by time or by user or whatever. But uh, POCs, free POCs. I'll talk to entrepreneurs, pr proof of concepts. Yeah. I'll talk to entrepreneurs and they'll say, I have 10 customers. I say, oh, great, you have 10 paying customers? Well, no, they're not paying me. Well, then they're not a customer. And you got to realize that separating someone from their wallet is one of the hardest things to do, but it's very important because that's when you're ultimately going to find out whether or not what you're doing, what you think you're doing is very valuable for people. Because if you, look, it's human nature. If you come to me, Jack, and you say, oh, Frederick, I got this new product. I want you to try it. You can try it for free. Oh, great. I mean, human nature. I'm not going to say, no, Jack, I don't like you. Or I'm going to say no to your product. Like that's not, it's easier for me to just say, oh, sounds great. But if I have no skin in the game, I'm not going to do anything about it. Meanwhile, you're going to sit at home being like, that's awesome. I got Frederick to use the thing and I'm going to go back and check in with him. And, and then you're checking with me. I'm not answering your emails and I'm not using the thing or giving you any feedback. Now, on the other hand, if you convince me that I should pay you a thousand or ten thousand or whatever, um, all of a sudden that shows up in my expense report, and my boss is going to ask me about it, and I'm going to say, "Oh man, well that's Jack's thing." And yeah, yeah, we're going to do this proof concept. I have to assign someone resource to do it, and all of a sudden there's buy-in and there's investment on both sides, and you need that map, that mutual action plan to really get people involved. And early on, it's hard because they're the guinea pigs and you got to tell them, look, you know, I'm going to sell this thing for a hundred thousand dollars, but you Jack, you're special because you're doing it up front with me. You know, I'll give it to you for 10,000. But by the way, you need to make a decision tomorrow because I got four more right behind you who want to do it. And there's limited resource. Time is valuable. And I only have two people who can implement it. So if you don't want to do it now, I understand, but you know, if we probably then can't do it for six to nine months because there's a big backlog. Just creating that sense of urgency and helping people understand it, they need to put some skin in the game is very important. I understand it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for people to say, hey, Jack, give me 10 grand. It's not a comfortable thing. You'd be like, what are you talking about? If you show them the thing and they're like, oh, this is great. This is great. And you say, great. Now, what if you told me it was 10 grand? They'd be like, whoa, 10 grand. You said, well, it's not worth $10,000 to you? Like, okay, great. Now we can have a conversation. Like, I thought we were driving this kind of value for you. I thought we were going to help you increase revenue or reduce cost or enhance security and isn't there value to all those things then you can really start to understand business as opposed to feature function and ultimately how you can drive value in companies which is how you can create a lot of value for all stakeholders yourself as a company your shareholders but also customers partners everyone involved yeah wow well you nailed it and i love uh i mean just even 
there. I'm a buyer. So <laughs> yeah, I can see how uh, you got off on go. such a good, strong foot. Um, another question here that I think is is certainly relevant, and I appreciate them. We are tracking all these that are coming in. Um, but one is just around. Hey, Jack, kind of, am I supposed to be looking at anything or I'm just listening to you ask questions, right? Uh, you're listening to me. Okay, cool. You're listening yeah, to me. Right. Yeah. So, so this one's just around the dating process and uh -huh. the questions uh, with your co-founder. So obviously you had a pre-existing relationship with Todd. So maybe there's kind of your personal experience, but then for those angel investors are saying that are looking for that co-founder, maybe what are some other uh, piece of, pieces of advice? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Todd and I actually were, were not very good friends. We, we knew about each other professionally. We'd interacted a few times. He was on the technology side. He ran all uh, product and technology for the, the platform at Salesforce, but I was on the business side. And so we'd interacted a little bit uh, through some, some business initiatives, but we didn't know each other very well. Um, and, and I think that actually worked out very, very well for us. I think it's um, it's trickier to go into business with very good friends. Now I say that I'm also the chairman and co-founder of a neurotherapeutics company um, working on central nervous system disease. And the CEO of that company, my co-founder is one of my best friends in the world. We had to have that expl explicit conversation before we started that business five years ago, because I knew that the trends were, you know, it can ruin a lot of friendships. I mean, it is hard. It is tough sledding, but uh, you know, we, we work through it and we talk about it. And we still talk about it a lot today. And, um, I, I think it's been great. I've gotten as we we've gotten in our busy lives. He's a professor as well, and we both have um, you know working spouses and children, and so we've actually gotten to spend more time together uh, than if we hadn't done the business, uh, which is great in addition to all the value. But um, you know, Todd and I are are still not today best of personal friends. I think we we don't spend that much time together on the weekends or outside of work. We have different families and you know different interests, and and that's worked out very well. So I think, um, you know, in our case, the Venn diagram overlap was pretty good. First of all, just in terms of experience and expertise, we were both enterprise software people. Second of all, we had this um, common, uh, you know, path in our careers of working at on-prem software companies. He'd worked at PeopleSoft. I'd worked at a few different companies um, when I was in, in college. And then we were both at Salesforce at the same time. We also knew a lot of the same executives who could vouch for us on both sides, you know, so there, there was this common understanding, but, you know, he was, he has a lot more vision than I do. He knows a lot more about deep technology than I do. You know, I, I'm probably a little bit better when it comes to, you know, getting customers or building operations. And so you want a good Venn diagram overlap where there's a good common understanding of what you're doing. Common experience is great. Common past history, but you don't want a perfect overlap because then it's like, well, we're doing the exact same thing. That's not working out well. And, there's so much to do when you're starting out that you need to divide and conquer. And so the, the best, the better you can do that and have good conversations, I think the better off you, you'll be early on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then one other, I'm going to try and combine a, a few sure. here just around fundraising. Yeah. Um, and so a couple different questions. So I'll just kind of lie them out. And, and one is around, um, you know, kind of the key metrics that, entrepreneurs should focus on? Is it the TAM? Is it the product? Yep. Is it kind of the revenue and, and the growth op? Is it a combination or, or how would you weight those? Maybe knowing it's likely a combination. And then the second part of that is in this particular environment, yeah. would you weight those differently? Yeah. Um, very good questions. Uh, and, and obviously critical ones as you're building your company. I was fortunate um, when I was at MIT, I got to meet a guy named David Morgenthaler, who started Morgenthaler Ventures. That was one sure. of the earlier venture capital firms, uh, incidentally, out of the Midwest. Uh, he recently passed, but he was a he was a great guy. And, and one time I was talking to him and he said, it's kind of like a horse race. You want to be at the bit, you want to be at the Kentucky Derby, right? So it's okay if you're at your local horse race, and, and but the purse is not going to be, the guy who finishes last at the Kentucky Derby is going to make more than at your local horse race, number one. Number two, after that, you want the best horse. He's like, yeah, jockey's important, but ultimately, if the horse is not going to win, the horse is not going to win. Then third, you want the jockey. And so, you know, and I was like, well, that's great. I don't know anything about horse racing, you know, David, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. And he's like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I, I got a reason to tell you all. This guy was like 85 and sharper than I was. And I was like, okay, okay, great. You know, si simplify it for, for simple people like me. And what he was saying was it's about the market, first of all, right? And you got to be playing in the biggest market possible. You want growth markets. 
you want markets that are being disrupted. You want markets where the incumbents have a lot of legacy business, but it's going to be hard for them to move. Remember, a big company, it's kind of like an oil tanker. It takes three miles for it to stop moving. You're a little speedboat. You can turn on a dime. And that there's a lot of value in that. So I would say number one market, and I'd weight that 70% probably. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you're, you could be the best ever, but if you've got a small TAM and you can't find more TAM, like it's just not going to get that big, number one. And you're not going to have that big of an impact, shareholder return. I mean, whatever the vector is that you consider success, you're not going to hit it or it's going to be considerably harder. And you don't want to go into a business where it's got huge capital upfront expense for small margin. It's not a good idea to go compete as a startup against Intel today. Where are you going to come up with $20 billion, start building a bunch of fabs? And at the end of the day, Margins on those things are single digits, right? So um, that's number one. Number two, I would say it's team, right? It's like that horse. You need the best team in the business. And so I'd weight that 20%. And then, um, uh, you know, because you, you need that team who is smart, entrepreneurial, hardworking, can, uh, can work well together, uh, can communicate, can attract, hire, retain, develop, grow amazing people. And then third, I would say product, because if the product's not perfect, you can pivot. And we actually pivoted at Okta. Our pivot was a little more of a, well, it was actually two pivots. The first one was a technology pivot and a market pivot from um, system management software to identity management. We did in the first months as we started talking to all these uh, potential customers. And they're like, yeah, that's important, but that's problem number four. And I was like, what's problem number one? They're like identity. I'm like, okay, great. We heard that 10 times. We're like, okay, let's go do that. And then we also did a go-to-market pivot and ended up pivoting further up market because the pain is higher up there and the ARR is higher and it, that worked out very well for us too. But so I would say 70 market, uh, 20 team, 10 product. Um, because again, you can tweak the product if you've got a big enough market and an amazing team. Does that change today? I don't think so. Like you don't want to optimize for these environments. Uh, is it going to be a little bit harder to raise capital? Sure, but a lot of people raised funds last year. They have to deploy the cash. I mean, in general, they want to deploy for three years so that they can go raise another fund. Remember, they get paid on management fees. Then they want to you know, uh, work with those companies for three years and then exit the companies for three years. And that's a 10-year fund. So a lot of capital was raised last year. It might not even be deployed this month, next month. It will be deployed in the next 12 months. So is there going to be a flight to quality? Sure, but you know that, that arguably, you're trying to build the best company you can from a quality perspective anyway. So yeah, I, I would say 70, 20, 10, and I don't see any change right now in the environment. Okay, great. So last question, because I, we're, we're about at time as, as quickly as this has gone by, but uh, just two things for you. One, kind I of- That was last question. What do you mean? I, well, what's the question and then what's what just- Jack, the, what are you, a sell side analyst all of a sudden? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so question is key takeaway that you'd love the audience to have from the book. And then the second is knowing that the revenue is going to the nonprofits. I'd love for you to just kind of share where people can find more information on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's, there's three big takeaways from the book. They're in the first pages. If you don't like to read too much, the first one is keep the main thing, the main thing. There's a lot of things coming at you as you're building a company. You know, email is a very good example. Email is what other people want you to do. It's not what you should be doing. So you need to take a step back and think about use Eisenhower matrix or anything else to prioritize what you should be doing. Number two, nothing happens until somebody sells something, right? It's easy as an entrepreneur to think you're building the most amazing thing in the world. We talked about separating someone from their wallet. That's where it's going to get uncomfortable. That's where you're really going to learn whether you're doing something valuable. And then third, Time is your most precious resource. Prioritize ruthlessly. Learn how to say no. I mean, I'm still learning how to say no. I'm not very good at it. But, um, you know, and, and make sure that you're really uh, taking advantage of all the time you have. In terms of the book, uh, all the profits are going to two amazing nonprofits. Um, one is called Build. Uh, it's a national organization. The other one's called the Hidden Genius Project. It's a local organization here in my backyard in Oakland. They're both focused on uh, working with uh, male youth and youth from under-resourced communities, keeping them in school using leadership and entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, those are causes everyone can get uh, get behind, you know, buy it for your family, give it to them at the holidays for their birthday, whatever else. So, Great. Well, with that, thank you. We understand, again, time is so precious and you've given us such an, an incredible amount of your day here uh, to provide these, this perspective and insights for our next cohort of entrepreneurs that are hopefully growing up to be just like Okta. So congrats again on the continued success and thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Colin. Thanks to the entire team. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it and uh, keep up the great work and I'll talk to you soon.
Great. Awesome. Thank well, thank, thank you, Jack, for facilitating such a great conversation. And Frederick, for taking the time to speak to our community, share your insights from your entrepreneurial journey and such a set such a great overview of the book. So on cool. behalf of everyone on our team and everyone in attendance, thanks so much for sharing so much. Thanks. Have a great day. Great. Right. And as mentioned, if you're interested in reading Zero to IPO, you can check out the link in the chat. And if you want to sign up and attend our upcoming webinars, also there's a link in the chat to sign up for our next upcoming classes. But on behalf of everyone on our team, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to welcoming you all back online soon. Have a good one.